أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على خير الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا الأولين والآخرين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين وحبيب إله العالمين ولا حبيب إلا هو وأهله الذي سمع في السماء بأحمد وفي العرب بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي يا وابنا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة العمى يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلا ما خاب من تمسك بكم والعمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما صلى على محمد وعلى محمد قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق ولاستق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله استفى آدم ونوحا وعلى إبراهيم وعلى إمران على العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم الله سبحانه وتعالى He rules and governs this universe in terms of what are known as the Sunan Allah Meaning that God has certain decrees and certain determinations which He applies toward this, which He applies toward ruling this world, that He acts upon His own will. For instance, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala determines that every single morning the sun shall rise, and every single evening the sun shall set. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes the divine decree that every twenty-nine or thirty days, depending. On that time of year, the month, the, the, the new moon appears in the sky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to, for instance, create this world with oceans and with rivers. And He has chosen to create the trees and He has chosen to create the mountains. All of these return back toward the divine decree and the commandments and the wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has applied in terms of creating this universe. Many times people, they wonder, but why did God create it like this? And how come God didn't create, for instance, it another way? These type of questions, they don't hold any value in terms of the wisdom and in terms of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because God can do as He pleases. This is His universe. It is up to Him to make whatever determination that He pleases and out of his knowledge, really no one has the right to protest why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did something the way that he did. For instance, a child going to school, perhaps the rule of the school is that school begins at 8 o'clock. Or university class begins at 8.15. You cannot go toward your professor or go toward your teacher and say, why did you make the rule like this? You can. Probably your teacher is not going to pay any heed toward your belief, toward your thought, toward your opinion, because he makes or she makes the instruction, and that's the end of it. You can't go to your professor and say that the class begins at 8.15, but I am going to come in every single day at 9 o'clock, and because of me, I want the class to start at 9 o'clock. You're probably going to end up failing the class if you come with this type of perception. Similarly, for instance, you can't go to work tomorrow and be like, look, my boss tells me that I have to be at work at 9 o'clock, but today or from now on, I'm going to start coming to work at 10 o'clock. Probably you're not going to be working that job 
for a very long time after you make that particular opinion open toward your manager. You can't go toward your office building and go and sit in your manager's office and say, you sit in my cubicle today and I'm going to sit in your office so I can overlook the ocean, so I can overlook the city because that's just because what I want to do. You can't do that. Because there are certain rules which govern the workplace. There are certain rules which govern schools. There are certain rules which govern govern the state and which govern this country. If you decide and you say that today I want the speed limit to be 85 miles per hour, guess what's going to happen? You can act upon that, but you're probably going to end up getting a lot of tickets, perhaps your license suspended and so on and so forth, because that's just the way that the government has decreed the law of the land. Similarly, when we bring that back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God has decreed and God has legislated that one has to pray five times a day, one has to fast during the holy month of Ramadan. Yes, you have the right and you have the ability to do those and practice that if you choose to, but if you don't, you're going to have to pay the toll of perhaps receiving the punishment of God. This is in terms of the legislation and the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this phase. But there's a second phase, and that's in terms of the universal decrements and ordainments of God. And that's in terms of how He wants to rule this universe, allowing the sun to rise every day, the sun to set. No matter how technologically advanced you become, no matter what level in NASA that an individual has reached in terms of position, he's never going to be able to, for instance, state that today the sun is not going to rise and the sun is not going to set because that's not the way that I want it to be. It's not going to happen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the universe just like that. We have to be amongst those who submit toward this fact. We also have to understand that there might be a philosophy behind it that God has presented toward us in the Quran, in the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wa salam. And sometimes there might not be an explanation for why God has decreed certain commandments and certain acts of legislation. Let me give you an example. Many times people, they wonder, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam as the, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As the last of his prophets and messengers. Why didn't the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala choose me? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appoint Amir al-Mu'mineen Sayyid al Wasiyin Ali ibn Abi Talib is the successor to the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And why didn't he appoint my son to be the successor of the Holy Prophet? Many times these questions when they enter into our mind, number one, we have to understand, these questions on the very basic level are invalid questions. There are questions that only bring doubt into our mind and probably only increase these satanic thoughts to come because who are you in comparison with the Holy Prophet? Or who are you in comparison with Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam? But nonetheless, many times we might pose such a question. Or a question might be posed in the midst of our discussions. We come and we see that on the one level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed the universe to be just like that. God says that I want to create Muhammad as the last prophet, of the last of, the, of the last of my messengers and prophets, because that's the way I wanted it to be. In the same way that God says I want the sun to rise every single day, in the morning and I want it to set in the evening. We have no right, no reason, no rhyme to protest that particular decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did God create Fatima al-Zahra as Sayyidatul Nisa al-Alameen, the leader of the women of paradise or of the worlds? Why? On one level, like we mentioned, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it that way. And we have no right to question the decree and the wisdom and the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on a second level, on a little bit deeper level, we come and we see that we do have a wisdom that is presented toward us in terms of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created his universe like this. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create and choose specific individuals and hold them towards such an authority, towards such a practice, towards such an important level in terms of his government? And we come and we see that these questions are not only questions that we pose, but they were posed toward the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salatu wasalam. People would come toward the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt and they would state, oh Imam, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose you? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose your grandfather Rasulullah? 
Why did he choose Fatima to Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam to take such a position? And by this, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they respond by stating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found within these individuals the most suitable sincerity and position and akhlaq and leadership qualities and skills which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them to give them such a position. Meaning that if anyone else, God had appointed them to take those specific roles, they wouldn't have performed their roles to the way and toward the value and toward that level that Ahlul Bayt salam had acted upon. That. But there is an even deeper philosophy and for that we need to understand the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world. When we begin to reflect on our station, on our position, on the eyes of the universe, oftentimes we don't see beyond this world that we're living in. We mentioned in previous gatherings that oftentimes the human being is always in it for the now. We want to know what benefit do we have today and tomorrow and that's it. We don't want to think about what's going to happen in 50 years. We don't want to think what's going to happen after we die. We want to only know and we want to only reflect upon this world that we're living on, or that we're living in, in these moments. Similarly, when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's universe, we see that we're always often only focusing on this world known as the dunya. But in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created worlds that are before this and worlds that are after this as well. What do we mean? In the narrations of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, on a very basic level and in reality this discussion is very very a long discussion and a very detailed discussion that needs perhaps days or weeks to come forth and reflect upon. But on a, and on a very basic level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this universe in three different dimensions. The first dimension is what is known as the pre-world or what is known as the world of spirits. Or in the Arabic language, in the language of the hadith, it is known as Alam Abdar, or Alam Al-Ashbah, or Alam Al-Malakut, the world of spirits. In this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our souls, He created our spirits, but He did not give us a body. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put each and every one of us through specific examinations in that world which determine our outlook in this world. And we'll get into an example of that in one moment. This is the pre-world, the spiritual world, the world before this existence that we're living in now. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a second dimension, He creates what is known as alam al-dunya, this world that we are living in right now. This dimension that we are living in on the earth with our family, with our friends, this moment that we are living in at this specific minute, we are living in what is known as alam al-dunya. This world is temporal, like the previous world, and it is the prelude toward the third dimension in terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, and that is known as alam al-jaza, or alam al-akhara, the afterworld in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will live in the barzakh, He will raise us on the day of judgment. And from there, He will extend it in terms of what is known as Alam al-Khulud, the world of immortality, whether we end up in receiving the punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or receiving the divine blessings and bounties for eternity. We have to understand that every single one of these worlds, they are linked with the previous one. Alam al-Akhra is directly dependent on Alam al-Dunya. How do we know this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states in the whole, in, in the whole of Quran, وَمَن يَأْمَلْ مِذْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرَيْنْ That for every single act of good that you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will recompense that act of good deed in the next life. And similarly, for every act of sin or transgression that you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you next. Furthermore, we come forth and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this middle world, the world that we're living in, and it is directly in correlation with that pre-world, the spiritual world known as the alam of dar known as the world of spirits. Let me give you an example. It is stated that on the day of the 19th of Shah Ramadan, when Amir al Mu'mineen at the time of Fajr, prior to the time of Fajr, during the time of Suhoor, he enters into the mosque of Kufa. 
He enters into the mosque of Kufa and he sees Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim sleeping in the mosque of Kufa. He goes toward him and wakes him up and tells him that it is soon going to become the time of Salatul Fajr. Many of you have heard this particular anecdote. He goes toward Ibn Muljim and when he wakes up, Ibn Muljim looks toward Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, and he says, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, I will wake up, don't worry. But why are you waking me up and why are you not waking anyone else up in the mosque? This is narrated in some of the books of history. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam says, Oh Ibn Muljim, I want you to wake up and pledge the allegiance toward me. I want you to give the, your bay'ah toward me. At this moment, Ibn Muljim says, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, why are you asking me this question and, none, and no one else? He says, I love you all, Ali. What type of a question is this? At this moment, Amir al-Mu'mineen responds toward him, One time, you don't love me. A second time, he says, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I am loyal to you and I love you. The second time, Amir al-Mu'mineen salam says, You are not loyal to me and you do not love me. A third time, he says, Oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, but I am loyal to you and I love you and don't request this allegiance from me when you're not requesting it from anyone else. The third time, Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wasalam, he looks toward Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, alayhi la'natullah al-awwaleena wal akhareen may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do with this man what he pleases, Amir al-Mu'mineen responds toward him and says, you do not love me and you will not be obedient to me. At this moment, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, la'natullah alayhi, he says, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, how do you know that? Why are you saying this to me? At this moment, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wasalam, he looks toward Ibn Muljim, and he says, because those who were loyal to me in the alam of dhar, those who were loyal to me before this dunya, in that world of spirits, they were loyal to me in this life. And I know that you were not loyal to me then, and you did not love me then, and you certainly won't. And don't love me now. The question that comes is what happened in that world? Were we loyal toward Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam? We come and we see a narration of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is an all an introduction in order to introduce toward us what is the position and the uniqueness of this great lady that we are here to remember tonight. In this narration, it is stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had created the souls and the spirits of all of creation 2,000 years before he created the body of Adam, according to a narration. Meaning we're talking about way before the creation of Prophet Adam and that whole story and that whole anecdote that we have heard about. In this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the souls and the spirits of all of creation. And then he created a fire in whatever dimension that we were living in during that day. He created a massive fire and he orders every single one of his creation to enter into that fire just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that decree and he's trying to test the obedience of his creation. At this moment, the narration it states that the first one to enter into that fire is Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad. After him is Amir al-Mu'mineen. After him are the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wasalam. After them are the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after them are the followers of the Imams and of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. They all enter following the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there were a couple of people who didn't want to enter, who didn't want to follow the command of God. And those individuals remain disobedient toward God and disobedient toward the Prophet and disobedient toward the Imams of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, in this life. A direct correlation between that world and this world. And narrations come forth and they tell us that we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt والسلام, were amongst those who followed suit with the Holy Prophet and with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt now coming back toward understanding why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose specific guardians or specific prophets or specific individuals to overtake certain roles in this world? We go back toward that world. And we go back toward that narration. We go back toward what is known as the Alam al-Bar. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He chooses the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in terms of attaining the position of the last of the Prophets and the most beloved of all of his creation because he was the first one to follow his command in that life. After him is Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the position of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam to be the successor of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then we come forth and we see that this is the test and this is the examination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offered all of his creation and those first individuals to pass that examination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them this blessing and this bounty in this world. And amongst the first individuals, amongst the first individuals to follow suit in terms of the instruction of God was Ummul Mu'mineen, Sayyida Khadija bint Khuwaylid, alayha, the wife of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And in the same way that Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam, was amongst the first to enter and follow the instruction of the Holy uh, uh, of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala by in terms of entering into that fire. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala demonstrates that she is also amongst the first to follow the Holy Prophet and be at the support of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam in this world. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala chooses Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam from amongst all of his creation, from amongst all of the women of the worlds, to fulfill four specific tasks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her and no one else in this world. Let us go ahead and take a look at what are those four tasks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her. Please recite one salawat. We come forth and we see that firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam to be the mother of Fatima al-Zahra alayha salatu wa salam. In the whole of Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states in the verse that I began with, Inna Allah astafa adama wa nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala imrana ala al-alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen specific creation. He has chosen Adam, and he has chosen Ibrahim, and he has chosen Nuh, and he has chosen the progeny of Al Imran, and he has chosen the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa wasallam, and elevated these specific individuals over all of the universe. And those individuals who are the cream of the crop in terms of all of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala is a Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his progeny which comes from the line of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wa salam. And that individual who was able to bear the light in her womb of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salatu wa salam is Lady Khadija alayhi salam. She is the mother of the mother of the a'imma. She is the mother of the one whom the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam states Fatima tu Ummu Abiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not choose this out of any sort of coincidence, but rather he realizes that only one lady can bear the light of Fatima al-Zahra alayha salatu wa salam, and that is this lady that we are here to remember, Lady Khadija, salamullah alayha. So on one level, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses Lady Khadija to become the individual who is the wasila between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and giving birth to Fatima al-Zahra alayha salatu wa salam. On one. Number two, we come forth and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam the position and has chosen her from amongst all of the women of the world to be amongst those four women who are the leaders and the guardians of the women of paradise. According to the narration of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Sayyidatul Nisa Ahl Jannah are four. That the leaders of the women of paradise are four. The first one of those is Maryam bint Imran, the mother of Isa alayhi salatu wa salam. The second one is Asiya, the wife of the Pharaoh, or according to another narration, the queen of Sheba bin Qis. The third one of those is Khadija, salamullah alayha, the wife of the Prophet, the mother of Fatima. 
And the fourth one of those is Fatima bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam wa alayha afdal salatu wa salam. So these four women have been given this unique position because of the test and because of the examination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put them through in what is known as the Alam Akbar. This is the second position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given and has chosen Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam for. The third one of these is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam to be the means by which the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is able to preach his message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the whole Quran, وَوَجَدَكَ آئِلًا فَأَغْنَى We found you impoverished, O Rasulullah, and we made you wealthy. What did the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa By which means was the Holy Prophet able to preach his message? By which means was the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa able to establish the rulership in the state of Medina? Which way he needed Islamic, he, he, he needed support from the Muslims, he needed support from specific individuals, but naturally whenever someone wants to become a leader of a specific nation state, he needs financial resources. And as we all know, the financial resources during that time came from Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam. And one point which we need to make mention is that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was not poor. The Holy Prophet was not poor. Many people, they get the impression from this particular verse and the, comment, and the commentators of this particular verse that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was very poor. وَوَجَدَكَ آئِلًا فَأَغْنَى And he was poor and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him rich. It wasn't only specific toward the Holy Prophet, but it's, but it's in terms of the entire Muslim community. When we go back toward reflecting on the life of the Prophet, we see that Abu, uh, that, that Abu Talib, his uncle who raised him, was very wealthy. As was Abdullah, as was many of those members from the Quraysh, because the Holy Prophet, he comes from that particular tribe. The Holy Prophet was successful in terms of business. He was wealthy. We know that. But when we come toward this position, we come forth and we see that the wealth of Khadija alayha salatu wasalam and the economic stature that she had was a means by which the Holy Prophet was able to propagate the religion of Islam within that community of Mecca. And we come forth and we reflect upon that and we see that during that three year period when the Muslims had been boycotted and they were stranded in the valley of Abu Talib, we come and we see that Lady Khadija alayha salatu wasalam would give out all of her wealth for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and for the Muslims until it came where she gave away everything that she had and the early Muslims, they had to eat grass and they had to eat the leaves from the trees in order to survive. And amongst those individuals who was doing that was Lady Khadija alayha salatu wasalam. We come and we see in the narration it states that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has honored the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala in terms of carrying that mission by Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam. And historians, they come forth and they write that if the wealth of Khadija were be, w w was able to be defined or relegated toward gold, you, you would need a hundred camels or maybe more than a hundred camels to hold the gold of Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam that was dispersed toward the early Muslims during that time. So on a third level we come forth and we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam to be the economic means by which the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is able to propagate his message. And fourthly and finally in terms of how and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam and honored her to have this position is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam to be the moral backing and the pillar of support for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What do we mean? We come and we see that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had to go through more trials and tribulations than any other prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've been mentioning over the last several nights the story of Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam. Nuh for 950 years, marginalized, boycotted by his community. But the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala states that no one has suffered like I have. Meaning that the suffering of Nuh over 950 years doesn't compare to the suffering 
of Rasulullah Muhammad in those 23 years. What did the Holy Prophet have to go through? Things that we don't even know, that stress that the Holy Prophet had to go through. Yes, the Holy Prophet is content with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for him. Yes, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa remains patient in the midst of all of these difficulties that he goes through. But at the same time, the Holy Prophet, قُلْ أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِتْرُكُمْ The Holy Prophet is also a man. He's also a human being. He has pain when those rocks are struck at his face. He was hurt when those individuals would come and they would curse him. It came to an extent where the people of Quraysh, the people of Mecca, they would come and they would throw feces of animals at the face of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. Everyone had neglected the Holy Prophet ﷺ, but the only place where he was able to find solace was in his home next to Khadija ﷺ. Which is why narrations of Ahlul Bayt, they come forth and they state that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ever wanted to send down a revelation from Jibra'il of the Qur'an toward the heart of the Prophet, Jibra'il would enter into the house of Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam and say, O oh Rasulullah, I am coming here to bring you the revelation of God, but before I do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his salutations upon you and Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam. Who is Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam? In the eyes of Allah, we cannot know. We cannot understand the position of this lady Salamullah alayha. But we come and we see that again, the most important responsibility of hers and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her is because she was able to bear the trials and tribulations of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi And that has taken suit and we have numerous examples of how she did just that. But as a conclusion, I will just narrate toward you this one incident in terms of how Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam had to bear with the trials and tribulations with side by side with the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is stated that one day the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in Mecca, he went out and he began to preach the message toward those small group of companions who surrounded him. When a group from those of Quraysh, they began to come and they began to surround the Muslims and they began to surround the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they started to beat them. And they started taking rocks and stones and throwing it at the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is very common in terms of what the Holy Prophet had to deal with in those first 11 or so years in the Holy City of Mecca. It is stated that at this particular occasion, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was left abandoned. They were abusing him. They were violating his rights. They were scolding him calling him names, throwing things at him, abusing him physically, until the Holy Prophet ﷺ began to leave from the city of Mecca and he finally found solace between a, within a valley between two mountains on the outskirts of the city of Mecca. It is stated that when the news had become spread in the city of Mecca, that this has happened to the Holy Prophet ﷺ, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa who was very young, he's a young boy at this time, he rushes toward the house of the Holy Prophet. He knocks the door. Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam says, who is at the door? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, oh Lady Khadija, it is me Ali. She says, what has happened to my husband Rasulullah? What has happened to Muhammad? Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam says that this is what happened. We have to go and find him. We don't know where he is. The narration states, that Amir al-Mu'mineen, Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam, they leave the home. And they begin to walk in the streets of Mecca for the entirety of the day, looking for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is said finally, they realize that he cannot be in the main city, and they began to leave toward the outskirts of the city, and they began to walk toward those mountains where the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was taking solace. He was bleeding, he was hurt, he had just been abused, he was taking some rest, after that episode that he had just been through. It is stated that at this moment, from a distance, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, he sees the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sitting all bloody, exhausted. At this moment, it is said that Amir al-Mu'mineen, he gives some sort of symbol to Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam, as if to say that the Holy Prophet, the beloved messenger, he's sitting over there. He's okay. It is said that at this specific moment when Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam 
saw the bloody face of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, she began to weep and she began to cry. At this moment, Jibra'il descends from the sky and says, O oh, Rasulullah, tell Khadija salam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given her his salam and tell her to remain patient and not to weep because her tears are having an effect on the angels in the sky. It is said that at this moment, we come forth and we see that Lady Khadija alayha salatu wasalam, she comes toward the body of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She embraces the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She begins to wipe the blood from the face of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Perhaps she gives a sip of water toward the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if this is the episode in the heavens and in the skies in terms of what Jibra'il tells Rasulullah during this incident of when Khadija wept for the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, then I asked Jibra'il, what did he see in the heavens and in the skies when Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wa salam was lying on the plains of Karbala? And this episode has a very mirror image to when Imam al Hussein is lying on the plains of Karbala. And Zainab alayhi salam is walking toward the body of Imam al-Hussein. It is said that at that moment, Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam, she was able to embrace the body of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But Lady Zainab alayhi salam, she was unable to embrace the body of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam because Shimr bin dil was sitting on his chest. It is stated that at this moment, Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam, she was able to remove the blood from the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But Lady Zainab alayhi salatu wa salam had to watch 360 arrows being pierced through the body of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. It is stated that perhaps on that day, Lady Khadija alayhi salatu wa salam she offered some water toward Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on the day of Ashura, he looks toward his enemy and he says, Bijaddi Rasulullah anachan. I swear by my grandfather Rasulullah, I am thirsty. Ala la'anatullah ala al-qawm al-bahimun. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'un. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To allow us to receive the blessing of the ziyara of Lady Khadija alayha salatu wa salam in this life and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for her shafa'a in the next life. My dear brothers and sisters, there's a request for several women from within the community who are sick, many members, many friends who are not doing well these days during the holy month of Ramadan with our grief over the lady of the women of the worlds and on this moment we are fasting on this blessed day of the holy month of Ramadan, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant them a quick recovery with the ayah of shifa five times we'll recite with our hands raised. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Amma yujibu al-muthar ibada wa yakshifu al-su. Amma yujibu al-muthar ibada wa yakshifu al-su. أما يجيب المضطر ضاده ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر ضاده ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر ضاده ويكشف السوء رحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطاهرين ورحم الله من قرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة